Hello, welcome back. Today we're going to be looking at some of the skills and some of the basic ideas that we want to review a little more in depth. Now please remember to take a look back in your Fundamentals of Nursing book, review the skills list that has been posted on the Moodle. There is a lot more studying and review to be done than what we'll cover here. But we want to cover some specific topics and some of the ideas that often are either overlooked or more focused upon in the testing scenario. So we'll start with injection sites. One thing to realize is they may be referring to an injection site by description, not necessarily by name. And they will expect you to be able to identify which site it is. It does say landmarks next slide. And we'll say plus or minus a couple of slides because uh, when that was written, <laughs> there's been a, a little bit of a move since then. You'll see PP in the next slide, but trust me, we'll get to it. No worries couple things to keep in mind. Think about what angle do we enter? IMs, expect the 90 degree angle, probably a one to three inch needle. The material that's being injected that's gonna, that is more viscous will need a smaller gauge needle. So, and also think about different volumes you are able to put in at different sites. So please take some time review all that we will have another slide with the sites coming up and come back to this a little bit PPE at this point in time of course very important to think about protecting yourself know the order that you put the PPE on and removal make sure it matches what's in the book <clears throat> in census barometer, often people will mistake this with another device. Remember incentive, we are breathing in. This is going to be a slow, deep inhalation. So the patient will be instructed to do exhale first and then slowly breathe in. Remember with the incentive barometer, it has a little item in it that will float while you're inhaling. So you want to keep it between the lines, making sure that they're not inhaling too quickly. If you inhale too quickly, then you won't have good lung expansion. Next slide, the PPE. Good thing to remember. With the PPE, um, if you put your hands above your head, then the order for putting it on is from bottom up. Bottom starting with the gown, you, so you go gown, mask, goggles, then gloves. Removal will be in a reverse order of that. The exception would be the mask. So you want to, you will be removing gloves first, but the mask will be last because if you take off your mask and then there's something on your gown that might be stirred up upon removal and you are at risk of inhaling that item. So that's why the mask will be going last. Back to the injection sites as promised. So take a look at this, pause if you need to, but read these and then think about which location is it. I'll go ahead and give these locations now, but if you're still unsure, please pause this and think about what it's telling you. So number one is the ventral gluteal site. Two, the deltoid. Three, dorsal gluteal. 
four fastest lateralis. And five is the rectus femoris. Be sure to be able to identify that, you know, by a description or by a picture. I'm going to go to the next slide with the image. They could put up an image of a body and expect you to be able to identify by placing a dot where an injection should be put. So all these things, please review. You've got to be ready for anything they want to put at us. All right, another thing to think about. What's fastest, slowest? This one probably was not nearly as challenging for you. Fastest route, of course, IV. Next runner up, IM, and slowest would be sub Q. Other things to keep in mind. If it's a faster route, it also has a tendency to wear off faster. Although IV has a lot of advantage of maintaining a good serum level. So you always have to weigh the options and see what's best for your patient. All right, some more skills we want to talk about. NG tubes. Make sure you want to review the steps, of course. And importantly, we want to make sure that we can address any problems that arise. Now, I know, of course, positioning is very important with the NG tube. Normally, you will start with the neck hyperextended, begin to insert, and then as we get to the back of the throat, tilt the head forward and with the chin down towards the chest, that's when we begin instructing the patient to sip water and then complete the insertion. Things you might consider. What if the patient begins to cough during insertion? Well, if there's a minor cough, pull back a little bit. We don't want to necessarily pull it all the way out, but pull back a little bit We because the idea is it may be entering the wrong pipe. So pull it back a little bit, make sure we have good positioning and feed it through. Oh, and hopefully we'll be able to start with the swallowing. You may have somebody who might refuse to swallow or you may have somebody who may refuse to change positions. If you are faced with the question of what to do with somebody who will only be in one position, how would we want to position this person? Think about what is going to be the safest option. Often I hear people want to choose to put them in the hyperextended position because that will make it easier to get down into the throat but that's not the safest choice because that puts them at a higher risk going to the trachea. The most important part is having the chin down towards the chest because that is the best swallowing position and we want to make sure this tube goes into the stomach. So if you have to make a choice, we'll have the chin tilted down in the swallowing position. How about checking placement? Now, of course, common ideas, aspirate contents and check the pH balance. Common and expected practice. If they give an option though to do an x-ray, that will be your best option. Now, please don't try to think, well, where I work, there's never an x-ray tech available. Remember, we are in a testing setting. We're in either HESI land or NCLEX land where all the resources that you need are available to you. And we're going to go with 
the best choice possible. So check, checking tube placement, if the option's available to you, go with the x-ray. Tube feeding. Now, in this case, uh, generally we're talking about a G-tube. So, with the feeding, how long will we have the head of bed up? Well, any time a feeding is running, that head of the bed needs to be up the entire time. If we're going to stop a feeding, we still need to have the head of the bed up for at least 30 to 60 minutes afterwards to prevent risk of aspiration. More things to consider. Tube feeding should not be stopped by unlicensed personnel. Always remember that we don't want to mix any kind of feeding or medication. If we're doing medications with the tube, now this could be NG or if you have a G tube, but we need to turn off anything, especially if there's any kind of section, turn off other things and let the body absorb the medication. Now, of course, if there's suction and you're back to an NG tube, then if you turn the suction back on, you would remove all the medication just put in and that would all be lost. So be careful reading these questions and think about what will happen. Other considerations, if you have a G-tube, of course, head of bed will stay up all the time. Before giving a medication for a G-tube patient, we want to check the stomach contents. There's too large of a volume, then a feeding would need to be stopped, and we might need to delay any kind of administration if possible. Typically, you would remove the volume if it's too high a volume where you need to stop, then, <clears throat> excuse me, and usually it would be put back and then reassess in a short time. That way they could see what's happening in the patient's body. Are they absorbing it? Are they tolerating it? Or do we need to get in touch with the physician and change orders? Chest tube. Hemo versus pneumothorax. And of course, we're looking at blood versus air in the private space. Some other considerations with the chest tube. Make sure you're not manipulating, no clamping, irrigating the tubes, no stripping or milking. If you see something going wrong, or if it appears that there's no drainage, first thing to check, is there a kink in the tube? Chest tubes will come up again a little bit later and go more in depth, but make sure we uh, are familiar with the systems. We expect titling. Remember, uh, humans are breathed by vacuum. So it should have some titling and it should have a small amount of bubbling. And of course, keep that chest tube system low because we're going to use gravity for the drainage. Hey, moving on, we have Foley catheters. No surprise there. Definitely read through it. Make sure you refresh yourself on all the steps in the proper order. One thing that they really like to do to make sure you are really on top of it is put a question that's partway into a skill. They expect you to be able to take up the next step right where they put you. So they might not necessarily start at the beginning. Standard sizes, male versus female. Typically we're looking at 18 male, 16 female. Keep in mind, Foley catheters 
are measured in French. A larger number equals a larger size. <coughs> Obtaining a specimen, make sure all necessary cleaning is done. The port would need to be clean. <coughs> We're not pulling it from the contaminated bag. We're trying to get a nice, good sample close up so it might clamp for a moment and then release and get your sample. Condom catheters. When there is a condom catheter in place, it's going to be important that skin care is done daily. This can be done by a UA. It does not require licensed personnel. So without that, you could have skin breakdown. So review the steps of applying and make sure that the care is given regularly. Sputum specimen. Now a reminder, we went over this with the uh, Kahoot question, but we want to make sure it's a good solid specimen, something that comes from down in your respiratory, not frothy um, sample that comes from the mouth. We don't want to get a bunch of just spit. We want to get the material that's down in the respiratory system that's causing a problem. So nice and deep. Huff coughs might help, but we want to bring it up from down below. Wound culture. We may need to clean superficial drainage off before actually obtaining the culture. If asked, remember that you will start the middle and work your way out. Make sure we're not bringing any contaminants towards the wound. Once superficial drainage can be cleaned out, we could swab a bed, the wound bed that is. Make sure the swab goes carefully into the culture tube without touching anything and then crush the yeah, fuel at the bottom. And your dressing would be applied afterwards. But the stool assessment, the main thing we want to address right now is to make sure that it is not contaminated with somebody's urine. Oftentimes they want to use what they call a hat to collect the specimen. And if the patient were to urinate in there, it would be contaminated and not usable. Transfers. Safety precautions. Remember that you have to take care of yourself also. Make sure it's going to be safe, not just for the patient, but for the people who are assisting with the transfer. If you have somebody who's unconscious, very important to make sure you consider what the weight is. If you have to look at their chart, that's what, so be it. But if you need more help, you know, say if you are there with one other person and you find you have a 400 pound patient, you might, you'll want to call in additional help. It's not only safer for the patient, but we want to make sure we take care of ourselves first. Don't hurt your back, very common um, injury for nurses. <clears throat> Before a conscious person gets moved, we also want to make sure, of course, that they will be safe. And one of the biggest considerations there is orthostatic hypotension. We want to make sure that are they are if they are on any medications that may cause a drop in blood pressure. You'll want to instruct them to dangle their feet or to the side. Make sure they move slowly. If they have any complaint of dizziness or any kind of indication that they may fall, we want to have them sit back down. Safety does come first. If you're assisting with a wheelchair, position the wheelchair to the strong side of the person. Remember, we want to 
as much as possible, have the patient assist where they can. Before sitting, if we have a patient that stands, they're going to a chair to sit. Remember, we want to make sure they can feel the wheelchair to the back of their legs before sitting down, both legs. Another thing to keep in mind with that, for your geriatric patients, center of gravity is moving. They are less stable now. So instead of being at the center of mass, the center of weight has moved up towards the upper torso. So we have to exercise a high level of caution. Our daily weights. Of course, we always want to have same time. Same clothing, or <laughs> same type of clothing. Now, if the uh, person who began the weights when the patient got there, if they started it at 2 o'clock p.m., 1,400 hours, then guess what? Next day, you will do it at 1,400 hours. Yes, ideally, you would like to do it in the morning before eating in their same PJs each night, but it doesn't always happen that way. Consistency and time and outfit though is, is the most important part here. Race. Remember to race? Related to a fire. Rescue. Rescue your patients. Activate. So of course activating any kind of alarm or EMS system contain, you know, contain the fire, evacuate or extinguish for the E, depending on which way it's being used. Remember with this acronym, they don't have to use those exact words. You could be presented with a question about race and they'll describe the terms instead of using those exact words. So Read it a couple times, make sure you are comfortable with everything and, and with the order that you need to do all the moves. Minimum urinary output per hour. Of course, we've brought this up several times. 30 milliliters is your key number. Anytime you see output, Less than 30 milliliters, pay close attention to that. Most likely that's going to be your biggest concern right then. How many hours max without voiding? Well, we're going to go ahead and give the, the patient eight hours before we start imp implementing interventions unless otherwise ordered. So if your patient hasn't or uh, hasn't urinated in six hours, we're going to continue to wait and monitor. Of course, there could be other circumstances apply, but unless it states specifically with an order that you need to act on it before the eight hours time, give them the time frame. If the patient is able to urinate on their own at six and a half hours, that will be a lot better for the patient than if we were to straight cath them at six. So we want to make sure we're doing what's best for your patient. Special dressings or an eye patch. You've got consider the different dressings and consider things such as the wording that they will use to describe it. For example, if we are talking about putting an eye patch on a patient, it would be from the forehead or the center of the forehead to the zygomatic area of the side of the face. Now that's not how you might normally describe it, but they're going to use proper medical terminology. So you want to make sure you are familiar and comfortable with that terminology. Remember your basics with sterile setup and procedure. Um, be good for you to review, not just reading it in the book, but pull up maybe some YouTube while we're 
kind of stuck at home right now under governor orders. Uh, we still have a lot of resources online, so it'd be a good idea maybe to pull up some of the procedure videos and review that. Remember the basics, such as for the sterility to be maintained, it must be above waist level. Don't turn your back on it. Keep in mind that they, they could present videos of this. You can turn pretty far before your back is actually pointed at the sterile field. So make sure you're not jumping to any conclusions. If the surface gets wet, it's not going to be considered sterile any longer. As you're opening up anything kind of sterile packaging or setting up a sterile field, you'll start, of course, opening away from you. Do not reach across a sterile field. Allow six, at least six inches between the body and the sterile field. When it comes to gloving, again, it would be a great idea to pull up some videos, review that, maybe even practice at home. If you have a glove resource, you can fold the cuff out. Watch those thumbs. A lot of times they like to have a thumb touching where what should be a sterile surface. At any time, anything non-sterile comes into contact, the entire thing is considered not sterile any longer. In which case, if in a testing environment, they would often say something like, you need to review sterile procedure with whomever is messing it up. If presented with changing of a sterile dressing, please remember the dirty dressing would be removed with clean gloves. You do not use sterile gloves to take off a dirty dressing. Your hands, of course, are going to get dirty from the old dressing, and so it's pointless to use sterile gloves at that time. After removing the old dressing and when you're going to apply the new sterile dressing that's when sterile gloves would be applied. And also keep in mind some skills such as suctioning a trick where you will have one clean hand and one sterile hand. So please be sure to review all of these things. Yeah. You are welcome to Get in touch with instructors if you have any questions or anything you're unsure about. We'll be happy to help you out. With IVs, <clears throat> of course, all the assess, the allergic reaction, and PN role all work together. What would the PN's role be? So, if you have a medication running or something invasive, of course, the PN isn't running it, but we do have the training so you can look you can check the IV site you can look for any kind of extravasation do they is it cold is it swelling is it burning is the site turning red there are a lot of things we can assess for even as the LVN if a patient's having an allergic reaction, what would the role of the PN be? Now, first thought might be, <clears throat> we can't touch it, LVN. We better go tell the doctor or the R charge nurse or whomever. But keep in mind, if, if they're having an allergic reaction, this could be life-threatening. Do we allow the life-threatening procedure to continue while we run around trying to get somebody else to do it? No, so we're going to go ahead and stop the infusion when the person's having an allergic reaction. <clears throat> Med refusal. Now, I'm sure it's been brought up to you. We want to try at least three times before anything else changes. But another thing to consider. If you have a patient who's refusing a med, before we start making charting, saying, oh, the patient will not take it, best thing to do, talk to them. We, we want to find out what's going on. Why don't they want to take their medications? 
Sometimes there's patient teaching that can be done or just some confusion. This problem may be able to be fixed without any kind of refusal. But the first thing to do is just talk to them. Remember that your patient's your number one resource for information. Last item on this slide we touched on earlier, but the NG tube to suction and med administration. Keep in mind, uh, a lot of times an NG tube will be on any uh, intermittent or <clears throat> regular suctioning. Of course, if we put meds down into the NG tube and put suction right back on it, we've just thrown away all the meds that were put into the patient. So make sure that we clamp the tube for 30 minutes after medication administration to allow time for the medication to be absorbed into the body. We don't want to leave the tube open to the air. We do want to have that clamped for patient's sake. Treatment and patient care. First, we'll look at the warm or cool compress. Now, often we want to get right to the ice bag, cold compress. Always, always, always remember we need that protective layer between the ice and the skin. However, they want to present it, there's many ways this could be utilized, but it's got to be there. <clears throat> Make sure you know time limits so that we can utilize warm and cool compress. Heat, we're basically looking at 15 to 30 minutes. Cold, about 15 to 20. You'll see different resources that might give little different numbers, but here's the basic ranges to keep in mind. Also know when you would want to use the type of compresses. For instance, if you had a sprained ankle, we'd want to put a cool compress. We don't want to put warm where you're going to have it swelling and irritated and draw more fluid there and also more energy. Another example, if you have a warm compress for the eye for conjunctivitis, Make sure you're not doing something such as covering both eyes. We don't want to build a bridge from one eye to the next. So a few details, things to review and consider with the warm and cool compress. Eye and nose. Measure and observe. Measuring, uh, keep in mind what you'll be measuring if you're uh, calculating INOs. Now, we're not going to be able to calculate fluid loss such as sweat and review what would be included in the INOs such as what are you going to count if the patient served some clear red jello or preferably not the red jello because you don't want the red if we can avoid it. But that doesn't mean it doesn't happen, so don't just jump to conclusions. Observe, review proper terminology, and yes, it is one of those unfortunate aspects of the nursing field. We will have to look at and describe some very unpleasant substances coming from the human body. Welcome to nursing, folks. On to amputations, stump care. We gotta remember to elevate the stump at post-op at least 24 hours, but not more than 48 hours to prevent contractures. Um, we wanna turn prone three times a day to prevent hip flexion contracture. Now the limb that has been amputated, the person or the patient may still feel pain there. We call it phantom pain. How are we going to treat that? 
we will still give the person pain medication as prescribed. Keep in mind, even though the limb may not be there, the pain is, and we will treat it the same way. As far as fractures, remember, elevate. Again, we have swelling we want to manage. We want to always assess distally, check your CMS, your circulation, motor and sensory responses. Always keep an eye out for wrappings or casting that would be too tight, uh, consideration of compartment syndrome. <clears throat> Foot drop. Range of motion will be an important exercise for prevention. Uh, you want active dorsiflexion exercises. There are different tools and devices that can help, such as you can have different boots that would keep the feet in proper position. You can also have their bed cradle that goes at the foot of the bed and actually will hold the sheet and blankets up off the feet, preventing extra weight and preventing that pushing down. All right. Well, that concludes this section of our lesson today. Thank you very much and uh, good luck in your studies.